One day after U.S. President Donald Trump declared the United States will pull out of Syria. I want to get out. I want to bring our troops back home. The White House was on Wednesday attempting to make sense of the president's statements, arguing the U.S. would withdraw, but not just yet. As this environment has changed because of the success under the president's leadership, we're evaluating it as we go. The softening of the president's position is the result of a national security meeting Trump had with top advisors. He was informed there was still work to be done. Withdrawal of the 2,000 military advisors and special forces could allow ISIL to regain a foothold in the region. We shouldn't have gone to Iraq. On the campaign trail, Trump pushed an America first agenda, arguing foreign conflicts have cost taxpayers too much. It's a point he reiterated on Tuesday while meeting with Baltic leaders. Seven trillion dollars over a 17 year period. We have nothing. It's perhaps one reason Trump is accelerating a withdrawal timeline. The other is Russia. Well, Trump has argued Nobody's been tougher on Russia than I have. A withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria would be a win for Russian President Vladimir Putin, whose forces have supported the Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad throughout the conflict. It would also be a victory for Iran. The Israeli government believes the Iranians are planning to use their forces in Syria to attack Israel, an accusation Iran denies. But one analyst thinks Trump's desire to pull the United States out is simply part of a bigger strategy. I think it's probably a good idea to put that on the table because it forces people to negotiate with you and to talk with you more seriously unless I think you're always going to be there. Despite the president's sense of urgency, the White House says the decision to pull U.S. troops out of Syria will not be made by the president, but instead by the secretary of defense based on conditions on the ground. Kimberly Helk at Al Jazeera at the White House. This year's hurricane season may be just as busy as last year's. Out of the five most costly storms to ever hit the United States, three occurred in 2017. Colorado State University forecasted the future Atlantic hurricane season on Thursday, April 5th. And it is looking above average, with the university's Tropical Meteorology Project already prepared with a set of names for 14 storms. Half of the 14 are expected to develop into hurricanes, including three major hurricanes. CSU's projection is based on over 30 years of statistics and also takes into account sea level pressure and sea surface temperatures. The 30-year average is 12 named storms, 6 hurricanes, and 2 major hurricanes. The season stretches from June to November, and in 2017, seven named storms hit the U.S., including Puerto Rico, with hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria causing massive damage. For United News International, I'm Cambry Caldwell. According to a prediction from Britain's Ministry of Defense, North Korea could launch a full-blown nuclear strike on the U.S. as early as July 23, 2018. A government minister gave the assessment to a parliamentary committee earlier this year. It came as part of its efforts to assess Kim Jong-un's ability to precipitate a nuclear war. Lord Howe is a British defense minister. He told Parliament's Defense Select Committee that the MOD thought North Korea will be fully nuclear capable within, quote, 6 to 18 months, end quote. The statements were made at a hearing on January 23rd this year. They were published Thursday in a committee report on North Korea's nuclear ambitions. An offshore earthquake rattled the shores of Southern California on April 5th. Shortly after noon, the quake registered at a preliminary magnitude of 5.3. The U.S. Geological Survey tracked the epicenter offshore about 35 miles southwest of the Channel Islands and 86 miles west of Los Angeles. But the sizable quake rippled beyond Los Angeles County, hitting Santa Barbara up north and Orange County to the south. According to reports, people felt the quake throughout Southern California, but it did not persist and shook the land with one noticeable quake. China's defense minister met his Russian counterpart in Moscow Tuesday. The intention was to show they forged a strategic partnership to oppose the U.S. General Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov also met in Moscow Thursday. They expressed the same sentiment of a forged strategic partnership. According to Russian state-owned media outlet TASS, 
the two defense ministers met for the 7th Moscow International Security Conference. According to the AP, in the last year, Russia and China have held joint naval drills in the South China Sea and the Baltics. This as well as joint missile defense drills. In the northeast drills. of Africa, the waters of the Nile irrigate crops that feed millions of people. The White Nile flows from Uganda through South Sudan and into Sudan, and the Blue Nile from Ethiopia into Sudan. And in the capital Khartoum, they converge and the world's longest river heads to Egypt. Now, not far from the border with Sudan, Ethiopia is building what will be the largest dam in Africa. A 1,680 square kilometer area is being flooded to create the dam's lake. How quickly this is done is one of Egypt's main concerns. Egyptians have to believe us, have to believe Ethiopia. Ethiopia believes in uh, equitable and reasonable utilization of resources win-win approach and uh, in true cooperation. At a cost of almost five billion dollars, the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam will harness the power of the waters of the Blue Nile. Ethiopia wants to bring electricity to the 70% of its population that doesn't have it. And the World Bank estimates Ethiopia could export a billion dollars worth of electricity every year. The dam will regulate the flow of the Blue Nile as it heads into Sudan. And the Sudanese are very happy about that. At the moment, depending on the season, the river floods or it's too low. A steady year-round flow of water will significantly boost harvests. But downstream on the Nile in Egypt is where there's potential for conflict over Ethiopia's plans. From above, you can see how much Egypt depends on the Nile. The country's pretty much all deserts. The only strip of colour is the blue of the Nile and the green of its cultivated banks. 90% of Egypt's water comes from it. One study suggests that if the dam's lake in Ethiopia is filled quickly, which means over three years, then that would divert enough water to kill off 51% of Egypt's farmland. And when you consider that Egypt's population is expected to hit 117 million in 2030, a 30% increase from now, you can see why its government is so worried about Ethiopia. An Arizona woman was arrested after using a taser to wake her son up for Easter church service. According to the Phoenix police, 40-year-old Sharon Dobbins tasered the leg of her 17-year-old son on April 1st. AZ Central reports the teenager did not complain of pain suffered from the alleged tasing, but two bumps from the taser were found on his leg. Dobbins disputes the police report saying that she only sparked the taser to get her kids up for Easter service and did not use it on her son. She told KNKV, quote, I didn't think I did anything wrong because you're supposed to put God first and that's all I was trying to do is tell my kids to put God first. Based on police reports, Dobbins was charged with one count of child abuse. Dobbins' next court date is set for April 16th. For United News International, I'm Lily Newman. The Afghan Taliban has promised retaliation for a government airstrike that reportedly killed Taliban leaders along with civilians, including children. The government said military helicopters targeted a meeting of Taliban commanders on Monday, April 2nd, killing 57 to 70 people. However, the Taliban and locals say the strike hit a graduation ceremony for students at a madrasa or religious school and killed over 100. The following day, the Afghan president's office admitted civilians were killed in the strike and promised an investigation. The Taliban released a statement Wednesday condemning the strike and vowing to take revenge against the perpetrators, even though it claims none of its leaders were killed. The Taliban also allowed journalists access to the site of the attack on Wednesday, including Tolo News and AFP. Both news organizations said the madrasa appeared intact, but an adjoining field had a large crater where locals said rockets struck. For United News International, I'm Matt Paul. The demand for salary increases for public school teachers across the country is spreading like wildfire. This week in Oklahoma, where 20% of school districts have four-day school weeks due to budget restrictions, teachers walked out on April 2nd after a new budget was passed. Business Insider reports that the average salary for a public school teacher was $59,850 during the 2016-2017 academic year. In Colorado, the average teacher salary dropped the most, where educators earned 15% less than they did about 20 years ago when adjusted for inflation. Teachers are fighting back, demanding higher wages, and several states, including West Virginia and Kentucky, have inspired teachers in Oklahoma to walk out of the classroom, hoping to be seen and heard. 
Thousands of Google employees have signed a petition urging the company to pull out of a project which harnesses artificial intelligence and could improve drone targeting. The employees are outraged Google's technology could be used by the Pentagon's Project Maven to better identify both targets and civilians. They also want the company to announce a policy that it will never build warfare technology, reminding Google the company motto is don't be evil. Google have responded to the petition by claiming the technology is intended to save lives and people from having to do highly tedious work. A deadly bacterial disease with no known cure that ravaged olive groves in southern Italy three years ago has been discovered on the French island of Corsica. Wild olive trees cover vast swathes of the Mediterranean island and the authorities warn the risk of the disease spreading is immeasurable. A strain known as multiplex, which is less virulent than the one that devastated olive groves in Italy in 2015, has previously been detected in southern France, as well as Corsica, but not on olive trees. Okay. A laboratory in western France is said to be working hard to identify the particular strain. Ah, Xylella fastidiosa, spread by tiny sap-sucking insects no, no, no. known as leaf hoppers, has also been found on Corsica's home oaks. The news is devastating for the island's olive oil industry, which has an annual turnover of some 3 million euros. Wildcat disposal and fly tipping of toxic waste is a problem that's not exclusively Serbian, but after a major find next to farmland and a railway line in the north, there are fears more ticking ecological time bombs will turn up. Some 100 tons of toxic waste were found on this farm in rusting or filled to the brim plastic containers while another large quantity was found cemented into the walls of a nearby brick factory. Figures show that there are serious quantities, possibly thousands of tons. That's why our campaign will never end. We will continue persistently to search every location where we suspect hazardous waste exists. And that is the way we can make our environment clean and healthy. Chickens were found freely roaming next to the barrels. The latest in a string of discoveries officials fear may be the tip of the iceberg after decades of what the environment minister called neglect, corruption and economic decay. Serbia lacks its own facilities for treating hazardous waste, which must be shipped at great cost to places like Austria, Switzerland or Romania. Norwegian ecologists have recruited seals as a new ally for monitoring the effects of climate change. The team on Bouvet Island in the Antarctic have equipped 15 elephant seals and 20 fur seals with satellite transmitters to send back data. Well, the tags that they wear for us uh, will provide us information on the salt content of the water column, how deep they dive, and the temperatures that they experience as they're diving. The seals dive to depths of two kilometers below sea level and swim under ice, providing the only affordable way of discovering previously unknown information on how climate change is affecting ocean currents. Iran, Turkey and Russia have made a pact to accelerate efforts to stabilize war-torn Syria. The three leaders met in the Turkish capital Ankara for high-level discussions regarding their influence over Syria's future and diplomatically isolating the United States. The US president wants to withdraw troops from the country, but his advisers have told him not to. Maintaining Syria's territorial integrity depends on preserving equal distance from all terrorist organizations. It's very important that all terrorist organizations that are posing threats not only to Syria and Turkey, but to all neighboring countries and even the whole region are excluded without exceptions. They also agreed to cooperate on reconstruction and aid. 
Everybody talks that it is necessary to participate in humanitarian aid, but very few do it apart from Turkey, Iran and Russia. We see small deliveries from the UN, but it is very insufficient, and what is sure, everyone must join in the common work to restore the economy and infrastructure of Syria. The three countries are working together to reduce the violence and rebuild Syria, even though they support opposing sides. Russia and Iran back the Syrian president, while Turkey supports anti-Assad insurgents. Tens of thousands of protesters have rallied in cities throughout Slovakia, demanding new elections and an independent investigation into the death of a journalist. The demonstrators voiced opposition to measures put in place by the newly sworn government and the delay in appointing a police chief. Their concerned corruption in the country is getting worse. We demand an independent investigation into the murder of Jan Kuchak and Martina Kuznirova and all the cases Jan worked on with the international team. Thousands of people took to the streets after the couple's murder, forcing the former Prime Minister and his Interior Minister out of office. Kuciak had been investigating the alleged misuse of European Union funds, which have boosted Slovakia's economic development, but also the amount of cash in circulation. He and his fiancée were shot dead at their home outside Bratislava in February. To date, no one has been charged. Future rallies are planned. New research details a rare and mysterious medical case in which a woman's arm bones disappeared over time. The 44-year-old woman first went to the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh in Scotland, complaining of constant pain in her left arm and shoulder. Initial x-rays showed a lesion on the woman's humerus bone, but it wasn't cancerous. The woman went home without any answers, and over the next year, her arm broke multiple times from minor injuries. She returned to the hospital 18 months after her first x-ray. This time, scans showed her humerus and ulnar bones were nearly gone. Doctors also found blood vessels growing where her bones should be. A report published last month in the journal BMJ Case Reports diagnosed the woman with Gorham Stout disease, also known as vanishing bone disease. Just 64 cases have been recorded. There's no cure, and scientists don't know what causes it. For United News International, I'm Cambry Caldwell. Who tried to kill the Scripples? Weeks on from the incident, there remains no determining piece of evidence that puts beyond doubt the question as to who was behind it. Of course, the samples taken from the scene had helped British scientists determine what the poison was, but that isn't the same thing. It was Novichok, they said, but don't ask us which country it came from, because it isn't our job. We are 100% certain that this is from the Novichok family of nerve agents, a military grade nerve agent. We provided that information to the police and to the government um, and that's really been our role in this. It's not for us to advise on who, who made the nerve agent or where indeed it came from. All of which is a bit embarrassing for the British Foreign Secretary who, apart from comparing Vladimir Putin to Hitler in recent weeks, had seemed to suggest that he'd been told by the same scientists that the poison had come from Russia. They were absolutely categorical and I asked the guy myself, I said, are you sure? And he said, there's no doubt. Which was seized on by the Russian embassy in London. It's pointed out that over the course of a fortnight, the British side seemed to have changed its story. Nor did it help the British case that some tweets from the UK Foreign Office on the same subjects had been deleted. The Russian side, roundly accused by the UK and its allies of disinformation, is by now in full flow, arguing that the UK can't stand up its arguments and, along with its allies in Washington, has made the whole story up to conjure up a new Cold War. Washington has become fixated with the fight against a non-existent so-called Russian threat. This has reached such proportions and acquired such absurd characteristics that it's possible to speak of a return to the dark times of the Cold War. In the middle of all this, the experts from the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons met at The Hague at the behest of the Russians. Moscow has said all along that many countries have Novichok and neither the British nor anyone else would be able to prove that the nerve agent came from Russia. The seeming lack of a consistent argument from the British side has only strengthened them. 
In a court of law, the burden of proof rests with the accuser. And while it's true that most of the British Parliament and indeed many European governments seem satisfied with the British assertion that it was overwhelmingly likely that the Russians did it, the Russians can still say, you can't say for certain that it was us. And they will continue to do so until and unless the British can provide categorical evidence. Lawrence Lee, Al Jazeera, in London. North Korea is denouncing a new American nuclear strategy that calls for the U.S. to enhance its arsenal of low-yield nuclear weapons. A spokesperson for the North Foreign Ministry's Institute of American Studies says the U.S. strategy is a declaration of war against the world. As part of our defense, we must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. Yeah. Perhaps someday in the future, there will be a magical moment when the countries of the world will get together to eliminate their nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, we are not there yet.